We need to get to today's content, today's segment, another edition of the Beginner's Guide to Trading Futures here, Small Stakes Beginner Edition, talking about what markets have futures. We talked a little bit in the prior episode of the Beginner Edition of Small Stakes about just what futures are, trying to get a handle on the concept. Now, Mm -hmm. today I want to talk about lending that concept to a few different assets, markets, whatever word you want to use there to see like, oh, that's why I would maybe go to futures for that exposure as opposed to stocks, um, which are uh, here in 2021, a lot more ubiquitous and more uh, used. I mean, access and exposure to um, both traditional markets, but new markets that stocks don't access, that's a pretty big part of futures, right, Mikey? Absolutely. Yeah. You have a lot of people trying to reach outside of what's really possible with an ETF with products like USO. I mean, it always kind of like befuddled me is you have this future that tracks oil and then you have this ETF that is comprised of the futures that track the oil. It's like, why all this complexity? Just go right to the commodity. And that is one market that futures tend to be particularly better than stocks and ETFs at tracking. Absolutely. It's a great example. We'll get to that and more here in a second. A little bit of a refresher. We're going to nail this into everybody's head so that there is... Now, I mean, it's one of those things that like, The first futures textbook that I read a handful of years ago, you read the first couple paragraphs of what futures are 10 times and you're still like, I can't get over this definition. And that's because it's pretty absurd. And I wouldn't advise anyone to go read those textbooks. But let's just like kick it off again by going over the concept of what futures are and what they allow you to do, which is trade the future. And We talked about rice farmers back in the 1800s and then agricultural farmers here in the U.S. in the 1900s using futures, inventing them as just this sense of like today, corn prices in the supermarket and everywhere are X. And in six months from now, I, a producer of corn, am going to have a lot of corn on my hands and I want to make sure right now that in six months from now i get paid x or you know x plus a couple points or x minus a couple points to lock in that price to reduce a little bit of the volatility between now and whatever whenever date in the future is next month two months from now three months from now six i mean some futures go out multiple years in their expirations um but i mean this idea of futures allowing you to trade the future price of a product, are we getting somewhere there? Or it's rarely helpful, I think, to define something with the word in the definition. But I mean, it's a matter of like today, an asset like a a, a bushel of wheat or whatever is $5. I know I'm gonna have thousands of bushels in in, uh, a month from now. And I want to lock in the price that is maybe $6, maybe it's $5.50, maybe it's $4.75. I want to lock that in today, what the price will be next month. And the difference between today and next month, all of that volatility and what happens, um, it's not going to really affect me since I've locked in that price. Yeah. And for a farmer, it's really for planning purposes, right? Like I, I know I'm going to produce this much corn. So I want to make sure that I get paid this much for producing that corn. So I understand how much I have to prepare for the next season or cover maintenance or whatever it may be, just removing that uncertainty that we often call volatility. But in practice, we really don't have to worry about that. Right, Frank? Sure. Yeah. And, and but there are a couple of instances like commodities, almost all of them, the price of the thing right now is pretty different than the price of the future that is a month from now or a couple months from now. And that is because like, it it makes sense when you start to think through it, like something like crude oil or something like corn, uh, where depending on what time of year it is, it's just like, oh yeah, like right now that thing might be $5, but there's expected to be some volatility in this market where the risk is 
to the upside and this market could move higher. So the future for a month from now is trading at six. Now, of course you can trade, you can buy or sell corn or crude oil or what have you today. That's called the cash market. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, um, and because it has low costs and everything else we'll get into later, but a lot of people choose to trade those futures um, because they want that exposure of what's going to happen at that future date. Another really apt market to use in some of these analogies is interest rates. And you think about the fact that the Fed right now has said, you know, short-term interest rates are zero. We're going to hold them at zero for at least, you know, the next few months to next year or so. Okay, well then there's no point in me buying or selling a market that's at zero and the people who move that market around say it's going to stay mm -hmm. at zero. But to trade a future on that interest rate for a year in the future, for two years in the future, like the small two-year futures that we have, that's something that's going to move. And that's something that you could say, I think that that interest rate is going to be 50 basis points higher or 100 basis points higher. So I'm going to buy it, that future right now trading at around 25 basis points. I'm going to buy it there thinking that by the time we reach that two years in the future, the market will have moved up to 50 basis points or 100. It's, it's, you know, it's similar to options and option skew mm -hmm. and, and all of that stuff where it's like, if you're looking at an expiration that has you know, an earnings in it on Apple, um, that's going to affect the prices for those options. Same with these futures here, but I do want to just reduce it down to this idea of being able to buy and sell where markets are expected to be in the future. Um, similar with like crude oil, I think is, is a great one to keep coming back to, especially in light of recent news. Crude oil, the spot market, the cash market, today's market of crude oil spiked in recent weeks due to the storms and, and the idea of a reduction in supply coming unexpectedly. But guess what happened to the futures for two months from now, three months from now, four months from now? Those didn't spike as much, and they actually traded under that front, that, that cash market, that spot market, a little bit, because the idea was, well, why would crude oil in – November or December be mm -hmm. really high when these storms are only going to affect crude oil here in September. And so mm -hmm. that maybe is another example of, you know, where markets are expected to be reflected in those futures prices versus the cash market of just where, uh, where the market is today. It's, you know, it's the, the cash market for stocks is just like the S and P 500, the spy ETF or the S and P 500 index, what that's printing right now is going to be a little different than the futures on it for September and December and then going on into next year. So you have this underlying asset, this cash market or this spot market that is moving in its price. And then you have this future, which is obviously related to the underlying. It's also moving in price. But in addition to moving relative to the spot, it's also moving in relation to people's expectations. Yeah. And that's why you may have slight deviations in the prices there between the spot in the actual future, but ideally they track the underlying uh, pretty seamlessly. Well, and think about it, it's the same way that like every market, be it options or not derivatives markets, like just the shares of any stock, mm -hmm. it, it all runs on supply and demand. And so like everyone's like, well, what what's keeping you know, the December futures for crude oil from just like being at 100 or being down mm. to 50 when the spot market spot markets at 70. And it's like, oh, because no one would pay those prices. Like, yeah. like that, those prices are unreasonable. And so like the, those markets, similar with like options, it's like, oh, options, the, the calls that are $100 above where the stock is, they could be trading at 50 bucks or 100. And it's like, yeah, they could be that's not going to happen. There are market makers in there. There are institutions, retail participants, no one's willing to pay those prices. And so it all keeps that stuff in line. And it's just a really efficient way of pricing where these assets are going to be months from now and potentially years from now. But before getting too deep on that, let's just bring it home with what futures are on currently, what the small exchange has innovated a little bit in and what we expect to go into, into the future. Because futures they do give you access. We don't like to, we're a startup, we're very young, but we don't like to necessarily, um, you know, throw shade to 
these traditional markets because we need this exposure. Futures can give you direct access to some of these markets. Mikey, why don't you dive into a couple of them here? Yeah, we mentioned earlier on the origin story of futures being agricultural products like rice and that eventually evolved, especially in Chicago where we're based, into things like corn and soybeans and wheat. And there were futures on livestock, which aren't really as popular nowadays. But then it, it, it kind of expanded as well to cover energy products like crude oil. And there are different grades of crude oil that futures track. There's West, West Texas Intermediate and there's Brent and there's a Houston delivery hub. Metals like Precious metals, for one, like gold, silver, and platinum. And then also more industrial metals like copper and aluminum that are used more in building, for example. And then we kind of get into the abstract a little bit. We move outside of the tangibles, agricultures, energies, and metals, and get into things that are a little more interesting and kind of abstract, like stock indexes. You can take the S&P 500 index and you can put a futures contract that tracks the performance of those 500 constituents. You can track things like interest rates, which we mentioned earlier, and even foreign exchange. So the exchange rate between US dollars and euros, you can trade that relationship in a futures contract. It's actually widely used by many multinational corporations to cover their currency risk. If you're a manufacturer in the United States and you're selling goods in Europe, you have some currency risk and you often hedge that with industrial futures contracts on Euro FX. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it's, I mean, for people new to futures, they might go like, oh, this is interesting. This is a nice little thing that they did here where they put like futures on uh, corn and, and crude oil, these things that are, that are hard to access with stocks and ETFs, some of them impossible to access. Mm -hmm. And then when you look deeper into it, it's like, oh my gosh, like, these are the standard for trading these mm -hmm. things. You know, like the S&P 500 index is quoted in the Wall Street Journal. So many, so many different media uh, entities there. The futures that trade on the S&P is, is like the go-to thing to trade it. It's, it's mm -hmm. really funny as you dig into it, you can see how relevant futures are in so, many, uh, in so many markets. And they're starting to become more relevant in new and innovative markets. And we'll close here just on what uh, you know, we're doing, what other exchanges are looking into that we love to see, what we'll uh, maybe get into in the future. We just launched the first cannabis futures contract um, just a couple of months ago. It's all these pot stocks into one stock index that lets you trade um, that, that cannabis equity world with one market there, very small and efficient. Cryptocurrency, of course, getting into, and that's going to be a really fun space. Look for stuff on that in the next couple of weeks here. And then a lot of people doing weather futures and looking at events and elections and, and stuff like album sales and different little events. And then also we're going to get into the future of Mikey's running miles. The guy runs like between 20 and 50 miles every single weekend, and you'll be able to buy and sell Mikey's uh, September miles, his October miles. They're all going to be, I mean, what do you think between, let's, let's call it, let's make it easy for you, October 1 and October 31, uh, what would be the Mikey Miles futures? Is the, is the price like, is it at like 325? Is it higher or lower than 325? What's an efficient oh. price for those futures? It, it's that's actually a good month and there's going to be some volatility and that, that's like a old old crop new crop spread it's getting pretty fan because at the end of october october 30th i am running a 50 miler here in chicago the chicago lakefront 50 so there's training leading up to that and then there's like the big event so it could be that i don't finish yeah and that would be like a big drop in expectations on what the price of that future would be so there could be some volatility. If we can roll this thing out soon, October is a great month. And then February is the 100 mile or even more potential volatility and uh, assumptions into that one. So awesome. um, this month, I don't know, I guess I'm doing like 50 to 60 miles a week. So somewhere around there, add another yeah. 50 at the end. So I, was, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't far off there. Pretty close, like yeah. Three, three, three and a quarter. Uh, well, yeah, we'll look for that. That's a really nice thing about futures is like you can technically make – 
futures on any index that you create there and start buying and selling it, uh, the future value of that index. It's really intriguing. Look for Mikey Miles futures to come out soon, uh, but also look for more of this great beginner content that Mikey and I have been throwing out. Thanks, Mikey, for joining us here on Small Stakes. It's always a blast to have you on, man, and we really appreciate your views on just what futures are and how we can use them. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate all the comments that have come in through Twitter and and email. So please, guys, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about anything. I'm michael.gouth at thesmallexchange.com, and he is frank.caberna at thesmallexchange.com. Awesome, man. Well, that's it for us here today. We're going to jump out of this program and into Splash into Futures here in a second, Friday afternoon, but we got some trades left to get on the board. Don't miss that. Thanks for watching, everybody.